Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and in life there are incong incongruities, things you'd never expect would go together. A billionaire driving a jalopy, or a candy machine in a hospital lobby, or an Israeli baseball team qualifying for the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo. When you think of Israeli sports, you think of soccer, you think of basketball, maybe frisbee on the beaches of Tel Aviv, but baseball in Israel, most Israelis will tell you, the game's too slow, it's boring, not enough action. It's a game for American Jews, and it certainly is. For many of us, especially of my generation, but not only my generation, for many American Jews, baseball is a passion. But lo and behold, there actually is an Israeli national baseball team. And in the 2019 Africa-Europe Olympic qualifying tournament, here's the pitch that made Israeli baseball history. Right-hander is working quickly, and he comes home. And this ball's flown out to right field. Simon Rosenbaum reaches up, and that's the out. That ends it. We could say it. It's official next year in Tokyo. Israel's going to the Olympic Games. There's something just thrilling, inspiring about those pictures. By the way, Israel went 4-1 to win the berth in the 2020 Summer Olympics in Israel. Actually, it went 17-4 throughout the entire tournament. And in large measure, the, ha the man behind it all is Peter Kurz, who is president of the Israel Baseball Association, was the driving force behind the development of baseball in Israel, and more specifically, the Israeli National Olympic team, which had a dramatic and remarkable run in the World Baseball Classic of 2017, stunning the baseball world by becoming the first team to go undefeated in the first round of the World Baseball Classic's main draw. It is so wonderful to have you. Thank you again for coming back and joining me. Mazal Tov Thank you. on the success you've had. We'll talk about it in a minute. Thank you, Mark. And Peter has been kind enough to bring with him to members of the Israeli national baseball team. First, it is my pleasure to have with us the outstanding manager of Team Israel, Eric Holtz. It is so lovely to have you at this table. I've been a fan. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. And mazal tov to you too, Eric. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. And a pitcher on the Israeli national team who earlier in his career was a star on the Yale baseball team, Eric Brodkowitz. Eric, it's so wonderful to have you here as well. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. I, I am thrilled to be sitting with all three. You all know I am a huge baseball fan. And, you know, I've, I've watched the development of baseball in Israel. And it has had fits and starts, Peter. There was once a real attempt to create a baseball league in Israel. Mm -hmm. And people like Art Chamsky and Ken Holtzman went over there and were managers of various teams. This manager won By the that. Way, this manager <laughs> was, the was manager. no. Did you? <laughs> I was the for which player team? coach for the Bet Shemesh Blue, Blue Sox. <laughs> Ron Bloomberg was there for a couple of days and left. That's right. I was in charge and of the team. And you took over. Yeah. That's how Peter That's and how I, got I got originally That's met. That's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. And Eric, you were a player manager. Player coach. Yes, sir. Okay, and what position do you play? I played mostly left side infield and, and pitched. We were short at third base. Short and third, mostly third. Okay, very, very nice. Yeah. Um, you know, it never caught on. 
Was it disappointing to you? Did you see it coming? What? Uh, it was the greatest summer of my life. Was it? Um, it was the weirdest summer of my life. <laughs> 120 players living in the same dorms. Um, so if there was ever any animosity in a game, you're carrying it back to, to the dorms, to the cafeterias, uh, whatever. Um, I think the league learned a lot. I think the people uh, like Peter um, and Jordy and Yaron and, and, uh, and the IB board learned a lot from uh, whatever success there was from, mm -hmm. from the IBL. Uh, as well as what needed to be done a little bit better going forward, which is, you know, Peter kind of took the ball and really, really ran with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, and creating so much excitement, uh, you know, since 2007. Okay. Um, by the way, the real question was whether it was going to catch on with the Israeli people. I remember I was actually in Israel, and so it was a kick. American Jews in Israel seeing baseball on, by the way, very rudimentary diamonds and fields, but it didn't matter, you know? Um, but it didn't seem to catch on with the indigenous, with the Israeli people. You agree? So I agree, and again, I'm going to tell you that Peter um, now has a full staff there, um, and what we tried to do, again, the, the idea was phenomenal, um, but it caught on for the people who already love baseball in Israel, the expats who, who yes. made Aliyah. Yes. And, and now Peter and Yaniv and Ophir cats are, are, are going into the schools and they're working with first graders and second graders and speaking Hebrew um, and teaching the game in Hebrew so that it becomes part of their physical education programs in school, and then hopefully, you know, they'll, they'll learn to love it a little bit, you know, um, but it was hard. I think, uh, you know, they had uh, some delusions of grandeur that uh, summer of 2007 that they would just, you know, have this incredible appeal, and, and really it wasn't. You know, okay. it was By the way, the, the goal was laudable. Um, in some way, there was overreaching. Am I remember, correct, by the way, it was the general manager from the Boston Red Sox or some Dan Duquette. Dan Duquette was yeah, head Dan of baseball Duquette, operations, right? yes. Uh -huh. And he was very much involved in it also. Yes. Head of player development. Okay. What happened was that there was no marketing done locally to the Israelis. They, didn't, they just didn't do that kind of work, um, which in the meantime, we've, I mean, we didn't have the infrastructure at the time to grow from that situation, okay? But the, but the contacts we made, obviously Eric, um, our trainers, a couple of our trainers are, are from the WBC. From the, from the, from the uh, IBL. Um, our, our national director for three years, uh, Nate Fish, was from the IBL. A lot of people that are still with us today and they're supporting us today came from the IBL 12 years ago. Okay, were you involved at all? I was the secretary general of the IAB at the time, so yes. I was involved, but again, I had just become secretary general. It was very okay, much... not uh, the way you are now. No, no, not at okay. all. No, totally. But wait, I want to... We've... If, if you've been watching Lachim, we remember that when uh, Team Israel did so well um, in the... In the last round, Peter was on with your filmmaker. Right, with Jeremy. Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Newberger. Jeremy Newberger. Right. right. Who did Heading Home. Right. And we were here, it was July of 2018. Yes, and we featured Heading Home, and it was a wonderful yes. movie, and in, in many ways an uplifting movie for American Jewry. But you and I have already spoken about you. I'm going to come back to you. I want to, okay. hear more. I want to make sure, sure the audience remembers. But I want to learn a little bit Jewishly about the two of you. You have a long connection with the state of Israel. If I'm not mistaken, you had your bar mitzvah at the Western Wall. Is that I, correct? Uh, that is correct. Okay. How did that happen? Tell me about your Jewish family, that you end up having your bar mitzvah at the Western Wall. You know, and my point is, you're, don't, you're not simply a ball player with a Jewish name, but there's more to your Jewish connection to the state of Israel, and it goes back to when you were a child. So... Uh, my, my father passed away when I was 11 years old. I'm sorry. And um, religion was very important to my father. And, what was his name? Uh, Philip, Philip Holt. Uh, Ephraim Fischler. Ephraim. Um, Good for you. And um, it was very important to my mother. Um, I Her name? Rosalind. Rosalind. And I, I believe, um, you know, to honor him, um, she kind of wanted to do the right thing. And, um, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a religious uh, home or household. Um, my, um, 
you know, my, my first uh, visit to Israel, um, you know, again, I, I probably took a two or three week, you know, trip and, and, and you know, had, uh, had the experience at the hotel. Um, but it wasn't again, you know, until I, I got back there at the age of 41 mm -hmm. that my connection um, to Israel really started to take place, Mark. I, I, you know, you talk about a home away from home and, and the love for, um, you know, the people and the culture and the history. Um, I couldn't appreciate that at 13 years old. Um, you know, and then to get a chance to have you know, that part of Israel, and now you mix in baseball with that, it was like my Disney World. You know, I, I got a chance to, um, you know, work with, you know, a bunch of youth and, and have been, obviously. Um, and uh, I stayed very involved. Um, after the IBL um, folded in 2007, uh, I got back involved with uh, Team USA in the Maccabi A tournaments. Yes. Um, you were very successful there. We won a gold medal. I won a gold medal as an assistant coach to Nate Fish. Um, I was his assistant in 2013, and then I uh, uh, was the, the head coach in 2017. Uh, we won a, a gold medal on Tuesday and then went for USA, and then Wednesday I became uh, the, the head coach of Israel, like a week before That's we were mazel, leaving to, uh, story. to go to Serbia. And now Peter can't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he doesn't even think that. <laughs> yeah. um, and we just one more question. Sure. As, you, as you look at what you're, you've been able to do through sports in Israel, in terms of your own Jewish identity, does it mean anything to you? In other words, look, you've been, you've been in baseball your whole life. Your whole life. Sure. Um, so you could say, look, you know, I love baseball. I have a passion for baseball. It happens to be in Israel. It just happens to be in Israel. Or you can say, you know, although I love baseball and it's my life, the fact that it is in Israel means something to me. And if it does, I want to know what that is. It means more to me. Um, again, as we talked a little bit off air, um, I don't really talk about religion and, and politics. Israel is just the most wonderful, magical place to me. Um, because, so I'm not religious. Because? Because of everything I mentioned before. The people, the history, the culture, the food. Everybody's welcoming. Um, uh, so, so it transcends baseball and religion. It's... So you have all these great things there, and then you added baseball to it. For me, um, and, and getting involved with Peter and the IAB and trying to instill the passion that I have for the great game with this new wonderful place that, that you know, the last 13 years really kind of just became part of me. Um, you know, it's just, it's really just been an amazing ride. You know, I've spoken to Peter on several occasions, you know, there's a lot of Jews in this, from our area in the Northeast that, you know, they go down South and they're snowbirds and, you know, down the road a little bit, I, I, I would consider, you mm -hmm. know, even going to, you know, live in Israel for, you know, a few months a year. That'd be lovely. Yeah. So Eric, so I told you, I, I went to an Ivy League school as well. It never had a good baseball team or a basketball team. Uh, it had a pretty good basketball team for a moment, and it didn't have a good baseball team or football team. So it's a real kick for me that you're Ivy League, and where were you born? Where did you grow up? Born in Chicago, Illinois, at Northwestern uh, Hospital. My dad was an MBA student at the time at Kellogg. Um, you know, we bounced around a little bit. I was there for two months, you know. I was newborn. My dad carried me across the stage when he got his uh, when he got his diploma from Kellogg. Lovely. Um, you know, he went from there straight to New York. We were there for call it two years or so. New York to the other Jewish hotbed of New Jersey. <laughs> um, we're there till you know it was five or so years, and then my mom's family, her parents, her two sisters, all live in Potomac, Maryland. Um, so despite my dad working on Wall Street. Um, working in finance, we, you know, uprooted from New Jersey and we moved to Maryland to be near my mom's family. Um, you know, my mom's family was a very Jewish background. 
my grandfather growing up was a very big Jewish influence on our lives. Uh, going to synagogue every weekend, we would go, you know, he would have already done his tefillin and gone through the whole service before he got to, before he got to synagogue. So he would, you know, take all the kids and go downstairs and like play with us. And it was, you know, it was really inspiring way to be introduced to Judaism. And it was, it was very welcoming and warm and kind of what a lot of Judaism was about and what it's come to mean, come to mean to me. Um, you know, he was a huge, huge in, impact on our lives Jewishly throughout our entire lives, still is. Um, he taught all of my cousins, so I have, I'm going to get this number wrong, I think it's uh, 12 cousins on that side. He's taught every single one of us all of our bar mitzvah lessons, and to be honest, this wasn't just, you know, learning our Torah portion, the Haftarah, this was making sure we knew every single thing in the entire service. I think the rabbi took a vacation day that weekend or something but uh yeah i mean it's it's judaism growing up it's been a really big part of where my family's been located of you know my whole jewish identity that is, family that life is a, that is a lovely story yeah. and it is not a typical story for you know if if i canvassed most of the yale st jewish students they wouldn't have your story and it sounds like I should have asked you, your grandfather's name. Uh, Robert. Robert. Robert Vernon. And it sounds like the Judaism that you grew up in your home, with, in your home and in your extended family through your grandfather and your cousins, whatever. I mean, it sounds wonderful. How many people came to a Seder? I, needless to say, we didn't have tables that were big <laughs> enough. Uh, <laughs> so I remember at least even this past Seder. So I went home for our Seder. We had it in my family's house. You know, we have our dining room table, and then we set up another plastic table next to it, and then another <laughs> plastic table next to it. And so, I, I don't know, I would say upwards of 20 for okay. sure. But you have warm feelings about Judaism and the Jewish experience you've grown up with. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that is wonderful. So you were on the 2018 first team, Ivy League. Mm -hmm. You're a pitcher. I am. Righty or lefty? Righty. How tall are you? I'm 6'2". You're a big guy. Not in the baseball world. <laughs> but by Jewish standards. But by Jewish standards. <laughs> <standards. laughs> Abnormality, I'd say. <laughs> um, but you had a very successful baseball career at Yale. You and Ron Darling. Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. And uh, how, did, how did you and baseball come together? Yeah, so it's actually, it's funny. So... My, my rabbi at Yale, uh, I went to Chabad at Yale, Rabbi Shua Rosenstein and Mayor Chaim, um, they were my biggest advocates in the baseball world. Um, rabbi Shua's son looked up to me, you know, he, he would come over at the Friday night dinners and, and just talk to me. And it was really, I mean, it was something that was very special to them. That's and it lovely. was, yeah, it was, you know, it was a really... It was a nice support system to have to see someone that, you know, was really supporting you from both sides, from the Judaism side and encouraging on that, but also, you know, really on the baseball side, looking at, you know, these are cool opportunities that we have. You know, I've been very blessed in my baseball career that it's given me so much in life, um, whether it's, you know, gotten me the opportunity to go to Yale, all of this experience, you know, the push to make Aliyah, everything that, you know, there's so many opportunities that I've had because of baseball. I've been fortunate enough to do relatively well. I had a fairly successful career at Yale. Um, and, you know, because of that, because of where I wound up, I'm doing other things in the real world now that I... You what know, are you doing? So I'm working in finance. I'm, I'm doing asset management right now. Good for you. Uh, so, yeah. Now, you're also Israeli. I am. You made Aliyah. I did. Formally. Formally. How does that happen? Tell us that story. Yeah, so I, I think a lot like Eric's story, you know, you grow up. I didn't uh, have my bar mitzvah at the Kotel, but, you know, you grow up hearing of Israel as this, you know, spiritual place that you really feel the draw and, and the allure to, you know, being in the diaspora. But Israel is always the central holy land. And so I made, I, I, I went on birthright uh, after I think it was my sophomore year of college. Uh, it was the first time I'd ever been to Israel. And it was really an eye-opening experience where I saw, you know, Israel's not just this 
religious place. It's not just this place where, you know, they're very high tech in the world because they have to be to, you know, protect themselves from everyone around. It's a place that's booming with life and with personality and with spirituality and culture, everything, you know. The food, as Eric mentioned, is also fantastic, so you can't can't downplay that to any extent. Mm -hmm. But uh, really, it's it's. I remember specifically sitting out in the Bedouin tents on one of one of our nights of birthright, and we were sitting out in the Negev, I believe, the desert mm -hmm. out there, um, and just looking up at, kind of looking up at the stars and just thinking about the history and the culture that had passed through that desert, and it's just really sort of grabs you and connects you to your Judaism and your past. And so that, to me, you know, that whole experience of seeing Israel for kind of all it is and feeling that connection was my first real grab and hook. Wow. Then, you know, the opportunity came after I graduated college. Eric called me up. Um, I thought my baseball career was most likely done. Um, you know, he calls me up. He, I, I guess it was through my assistant coach who... He had asked, yeah. He's going to downplay it just because <laughs> he's really humble. My son was a freshman at the time at Columbia, and um, I watched one of the best games I had ever seen at the college level. I watched a 2-1, 15-inning championship game played between Yale and Columbia at Yale in which this kid was a bulldog. And with the last down, you know, watching totally as a fan, and I go through the rosters and I see the last name Brodkowitz. I said, he's got to be Jewish, right? <laughs> and I was really friendly, even though my son played at Columbia, I was very friendly with his assistant coach. With so, Eric's assistant coach. With Eric's assistant, coach. assistant at coach at Yale. Just being in the baseball world a little bit. So I reached out to him immediately about uh, Eric and uh, one of the other players, uh, Ben Wanger, and uh, so that's how. All right. So you have this experience on birthright with the Bedou you're in the Bedouins. Yes. And you look up at the, at the heavens that Abraham looked up at. The exact same heavens. Yep. Okay. When the Israelites marched from Egypt ultimately to what was then the land of Canaan, they were looking at the same sky. Mm -hmm. But I want to know the moment that you decide. It's no small thing, Eric, to decide as an American Jew to also make Aliyah. When does that happen? About five minutes after Eric called me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was it being, being on Team Israel that prompted this? That was, I would definitely say, you know, there was, there was always the chance that it would happen in the future to some I extent. See. I but was that very was, honest, yeah. You know, definitely the kickstart to, to, you know, getting my, getting my whole process started. Uh, uh, Peter, I'm sorry. Does... Does every member of the team have to be an Israeli national? Yes. To okay. be in the Olympics, you have to be an Israeli okay. national. Okay. So if you went to some major league ball player who happened to be Jewish, mm -hmm. and you invited him to be on the team? No. They, they have to be a national, and they also cannot be on the 40-man roster. I'm sorry, they what? They cannot be on a 40-man roster to play in the Olympics. You mean because if they're on a 40-man uh, roster, MLB they cannot play in the Olympics. MLB 40-man roster. Then roster. they will not be cannot eligible. Play. Right. They're not okay. eligible to play in the Olympics. All right. So... <laughs> They've been out of baseball two years. Now they're eligible. Right. Okay, but they must make Aliyah. They must make Aliyah. They must get Israeli citizenship. And it's not a simple process, as, as Eric can tell you. They have to go through a lot of paperwork. Um, there's a lot of things that have to be filled out. FBI reports, getting a letter from a rabbi. If they're married, their marriage certificate. There's a lot of uh, the difficulties. The FBI's involved in your becoming <laughs> an Israeli? Fingerprints. Yep. <laughs> Down and dirty. <laughs> okay. But well, that's lovely. Are you happy that you also have Israeli citizenship now? Thrilled. Thrilled. Yeah. Honestly, you know, it's something where I look at it and there's so much opportunity in Israel and it's such a vibrant place. And, you know, look, I, th I think most people living out in the world, most Jews living out in the world have a sh very strong connection to Israel. Um, you know, I can point to pieces of paper and identification cards that have that. And it's, you know, it. I... Yes, I, I don't think, you know, there's any drawbacks. If there was any ever a situation where it would come into question, um, you know, if I was ever in some country or somewhere where, where you know, that would be a negative, you know, I would hold that very proudly. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that 
is really important to me, and it's you know it's something that I strongly identify with. So, yeah, I'm I'm thrilled. Okay, Peter, I yes. want you to remind us. <laughs> okay, first of all, your Jewish journey, your Jewish story. You become you're, you're from where? I'm from New York, originally from New York. I was born and bred on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Uh, to parents who came from from Europe, who survived the Holocaust, and uh, and ended up being coming to New York. You are the second generation. No, I'm the first generation. No, you're, but your parents. My parents were from my from my mother's Your from parents Hungary were, and my, were survivors. My parents were survivors. So you're second yes. generation survivor. Oh, I'm second generation survivor. I'm a first yes. generation. I, I was a first generation yes. American. Yes. 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 Second okay. generation survivor. Exactly. Was that hard for you? Um, was it, there are people whose parents survived the Holocaust. Lovely people. Right. But it but it, it creates problems for their children. Do you no, have problems? No, I don't think I had any problems growing up. I mean, when I grew up, people didn't really want to talk about it or admit it as they do today so much. Yes. So they didn't talk about it. My parents didn't talk about it. They talked about it more with their grandchildren. When their grandchildren were around and asking them about what they happened to them and what they did, they talked about it and they came out. And my mother actually wrote uh, five or six pages about what happened to her during the Holocaust. Where was she? Uh, five years before she died. Um, she was in Hungary. She was uh, she ran away from Debrecen to Budapest, and she was in Budapest during the. She wasn't in a concentration camp, but she was in Budapest during the uh, during the uh, Holocaust. Okay, and describe the tenor of the Jewishness in your home growing up. Um, typical Jewish uh, conservative uh, family of the Upper West Side went to went to synagogue uh, every Shabbat uh, in Which the morning. Uh, to B'nai Jeshurun okay. on 88th Street. Good for you. Um, I did not have my bar mitzvah there, by the way. Because Where did you? Because what happened was that my, my birthday was at the end of June, and the rabbi said that the synagogue is closed for the summer. <laughs> so you have to have your That's bar mitzvah. American Judaism. That's American Judaism. <laughs> was this, Either two weeks was before. Was this Rabbi Berkowitz? Ber it? Rabbi Berkowitz, right. exactly. Either two weeks before or in September. <laughs> and my father said to him, I'm sorry, but we're going to take it to a shtetl. There was a small shtetl on 90th Street and Riverside Drive, an Orthodox uh, shtetl where I had my bar mitzvah there. Um, the rabbi there spoke to me in Yiddish, which I did not understand. My parents spoke Yiddish among themselves, but I did not understand Yiddish, and they threw candies at me, which I learned today is, uh, is very acceptable there. That was the first time I saw anybody throwing yeah. candies at me. And I also came to Israel very often when I was a kid, because uh, I actually came to Israel in 1967 um, as a 10-year-old, two weeks after the Six-Day War. How did that happen? Most of my family was in Israel, because most of my, my father's two sisters and mother and my, my mother's father had all immigrated to Israel after the war. My parents ended up in, in, the, in the United States. So we went to visit them very often when I was a child. And you remember it's right after the Six-Day War. I remember everything oh, right after the Six-Day War. That was a very war. exciting time, wasn't it? Incredibly exciting. To be in the, in the, by the Kotel when yes. everything was rubble. Yes. Because they had just torn down all the buildings yes. there. And to be there, to go to Bethlehem and to Ramallah and to, to Jericho and all those places, that was incredible. Yes. It was incredible. My father, the American, took all his Israeli you know, Jewish family there and we went around and... That, I mean, when I got back, my whole wall was filled with Moshe Dayan and oh, uh, Kol HaKavod Mitzahal and uh, lovely, everything lovely. was there. That okay. became very, very Zionist. Okay. And ha that followed you through your college days, et cetera? Right. Through my college days, we were here, and I also went to graduate school in Israel. Where? Um, in Tel Aviv University. Did my MBA in Tel Aviv University. Met the woman who is my, my wife today. We got married. Um, and we came back to America for one year for her to get to know my family a little bit better. One year became five years. Two kids were born here, and then in 1989, we moved back to Israel, where I've been living for the last 31 years. Mazal Tov. And you formally made Aliyah, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. Okay. At that time, and it was easy. Yeah. It wasn't like today. <laughs> it, good for you. Um, okay. Now, I want to know about you in baseball. Okay. Okay. So, how does Peter Kurz become so involved with the Israel Baseball Association and World Baseball Classic with Team Israel? How does that all happen? It, it happens very quickly in this organization because it's a small organization, so you end up going to the top very quickly. I, I started okay, in... Yeah, but uh, the, were you always in love with baseball? I was always in love with baseball because the other side of my younger days is when I was 10 years old, I came to Israel, but when I was 12 years old in 1969, the New York Mets won the, uh, the World Series, the Miracle Mets, and that was my initiation into baseball. You, did so you follow two, the Mets? Oh, yeah. You're I followed the Mets, Mets until fan? today. Until today, yeah. yes. I'm still a very you, you big Mets You can do the fan. infield? Am I going to what? Do could the infield today the infield? or in, in 1969? Yeah, can you do the 69 infield? Sure, Go ahead. sure, sure. Cl Cranepool and Clendenin. Clendenin was the first base. By the way, that is so <laughs> wonderful that you keep Clendenin in there. Yeah, of keep course, going. Of course, keep Boswell going. at keep second going. base. Boswell at second base. Harrelson at shortstop. And Garrett, at, and Garrett or Charles at, uh, at third base. Very good. Behind the plate? Behind the plate was my favorite player, Doug, Jerry Grody. Okay. And Duffy Dyer and, and J.C. Martin. J.C. Martin. This guy knows his, <laughs> this guy knows his best boy. Outfield? 
Outfield was Cleon Jones in left, Tommy Agee in center, and uh, Swoboda, and the Jewish boy, uh, Shamsky, Shamsky in, uh, in right field. Okay. Who caught the last out of the World Series? Well, uh, Cleon Jones went down on one knee. <laughs> and we <laughs> went nuts, a, right? And we, we went, went nuts. nuts. And we went nuts. Okay. But it was thrilling, was it not? Fantastic. You see, I was a huge Dodger, Brooklyn Dodger fan. Right. It right. was horrible for me when the right. Dodgers left. Right, sure. And then the Mets are somehow the resurrection of that soul. There's right. a neshama in the, in the Mets. For sure. That, that, and for, by the way, people who follow the New York Giants, they felt the same thing right. as well. Right. But it was thrilling, and you're right. Okay, so not only are you excited about Israel, right. but you enjoy baseball. the Mets, you enjoy baseball. baseball now fan. you end up in Israel, and right. lo and behold, you have an opportunity. So I'm in Miluim, which is the reserve duty in the Army. My son is about nine years old, and somebody tells me about baseball in Tel Aviv and the Sport Tech. So I say to my son, let's go see baseball. At that time, I was very much an Israeli, and my wife was Israeli. We are very much in the Israeli culture. I was still following baseball. I got my son to follow baseball a little bit. We go to the Sport Tech. Uh, he starts playing baseball there. The coach asked me if I want to help him be an assistant coach, and I said to him, I've never coached baseball before. I have no idea. I've been a fan. So he says to me, don't worry, you know more than, you know more than these kids. <laughs> so come on and help me. That was Leon, by the way. Oh, God. Um, so then oh, a few Leon. months later, Leon Clarfield, who was the president of the IAB at the time. Um, a few months later, Leon goes up north to live up north. So he says to me, you have to take over. And I said, oh, my God. You know, he says, don't worry about it. You know a lot more than these kids do. And then three months later, Leon comes to me and says, I want you to take a national team overseas. Uh, and I said, listen, I can't take a national team overseas. And he says, don't worry about it. You know more than they do. <laughs> you know more than they do. As long as, you take, as long as the same 15 kids you take ho over come home, you bring home, it's all right. You're set. I need a, I need a, responsible, a responsible adult. And he says to me, I'll give you a kid. He's 18 years old. He's in the Army. He'll be the main coach. He'll, he'll run the team and everything, and, and, and you'll be fine. And that kid was Shlomo Lippitz, who today is still pitching for us today. And on that team were three kids who are still involved with baseball today. 20 years later, this was 20 years ago. 20 years later, myself, Shlomo, and the three kids are still involved with baseball. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that was a very successful team. Even though we lost every game. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. Right. It's, it's, the experience was there. Yes. Yeah. Now, you've seen the evolution yes. of baseball in Israel. And I'm not sure it has yet caught on with, the, with again, the Sabra community. Right. But as Eric mentioned before, there is a huge number of American Jews who now live in Israel, and they miss baseball. Right. And I wondered whether, in some way, baseball has a chance to become something real in Israel because of that. We, it, it, today in Israel, there's about 1,000 kids and adults playing baseball. Out of that, probably about five or 600 are ex-Americans who made Aliyah and who are playing there, either kids okay, or themselves. Okay, if I went to their homes... In their bedrooms would be a baseball glove and a baseball bat. Sure, for those kids, yes, for sure. But the other four or five hundred kids are Israeli sabras who grew up in Israel, um, learned the program, learned the game, learned the game in Israel, learned how to play in Israel, came to the Sport Tech or to the or to Renano or to uh, Modi'in or, or Jerusalem, um, and are learning the game in Israel. And more and more Israelis are being involved in it or getting involved in it, a part of the game and learning the game in Israel. What I thought would happen three years ago with the WBC, I was hoping that the WBC would bring enough publicity and momentum to baseball in Israel to really grow. It hasn't grown the last three years as I hoped it would. Today, there's two things that are happening at the same time. One is the Olympics, which is huge. As soon as we came back from the qualifiers, I hired an Israeli PR company, and they're doing every week. They've got new things coming out on Facebook and social media about baseball. And uh, just, just, just last week, they had a thing about uh, what, what do you eat at a baseball game? You know, and it's, it's popcorn and Cracker Jacks and hot dogs and all that, because that's what the Americans know, but just to show them that. Um, and the second thing that's happening is that we're building two fields, two new fields in Israel. Where? One in Beit Shemesh and one in Ranana. Lovely. And those are being built this year. And as they say... How do you afford it? How do you... For the time? last 10 years, I've been raising money for, the, for, the, for both fields, um, through the JNF, through uh, fundraisers over here in, in the States, through fundraisers, sponsors in the States. We finally have a million dollar commitment from the JNF, and we broke ground in Beit Shemesh last week. Why do you think the JNF gave you money? Uh, the JNF uh, feels that that's a part of their mission, to to develop activities for youth in Israel that youth can do in Israel and play in Israel and have a, a, a normal life in Israel. Okay. There's a baseball field, a diamond in a field, yes. and then there's a baseball stadium, yes. which has seating and fans. What are you creating? A fields. field? Right fields. now we're just creating fields. I'm hoping that we'll have another 4 or $5 million from the JNF to create a stadium, a small, in, a small stadium yeah. in Beit Shemesh. Yes. Right. yes, that's what I, we're looking for. I, I, that is marvelous. Um, one thing, I just want to mention one thing. We, uh, our, our U18 national team, the under-18 national team that we sent overseas this past summer, 
um, went to the qualifiers for the European Championship, and they won the qualifiers for the European Championship. Wow. And in some ways, I'm much prouder of that team. I'm pr as proud of that team as I am of the Olympic Tell me team. Why. Because they grew up in Israel. They yes. grew up in Israel. They grew up in the academy. We have a baseball academy. Uh, four times a week they play baseball, and they're homegrown, and they're the ones, they're the future of Israeli baseball because they're the local players, and they're the Israelis, and they grew up on that. And you hear, you know, you, you go and you watch the practice, and they're all speaking Hebrew, and they're all talking Hebrew, and, uh, and they love the game. Watch, and they love the game. And they they're good the at it. Yeah. By the way, that's what interests me also, Eric. I want you to talk about this. It's not simply that Israelis did not grow up with baseball. They grew up with soccer or football, sure. and, they grow, and they grew up with basketball. And we know there have been some fabulous Israeli basketball players who have come and played here in the NBA. Um, now you go, and you're, 14 and, uh, you're 17 and 4? Okay. It suggests that the team that you've put together, and Eric in general, as you look at the composition of the team, either of you can answer this, what percentage, my instinct is, my sense of the team is, it's overwhelmingly American Jews. Is that true? That is correct. Okay. No, no, no. There's 24 Israelis. They're all Israelis. <laughs> no, no, but no, 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 no. They're, they're American Jews. You know what I mean. Everyone yes. understands what I mean. Yes. Yes. They, they're like Eric. Yes. They correct. grew up American Jews. Correct. They love they baseball. Made and they know what they're doing. And they come and they're pretty good ball players. Correct. Okay. And then they do make Aliyah. Now they're Israeli citizens. But they are not Sabras. No, at the at the beginning stages uh, in Bulgaria, uh, there were more sabras, were, uh, at, least eight, uh, sabras yeah. at least eight yeah. or, or or nine out nine. of the twenty four players were sabra. Okay, so I'm going to ask the two of you this question, and then I do want you to also chime in, Eric. The criticism, if there's any criticism, but in general, sure. it's just a lovely story, and I remember that when. You were doing this in 2017, was it? 16 and 17, yes. Mm -hmm. There were people all over Israel watching their TVs. Right. For a moment, this caught up. For a moment. For a moment. This was a big deal. Yes. In Israel, it was a big deal. Yes. Okay. But the critics say, oh, come on. This is not an Israeli national baseball team. This is a team of American Jews who have feelings for Israel, and maybe they don't. I mean, I remember the, who was on the first team. There were Jews, including major league ball players, who really had uh, the most tenuous, if any, Jewish identity. But that was World that's, Baseball Classic. That's right. correct. That is, they just have to prove heritage. I know, I know. Right, I know, right, I know. right. Okay, but is it the same thing for... No, the, no. Here, there, you, you heard what, uh, what Eric said before. In order to play for the Olympic team, it's a much more difficult process than it was to play for the WBC team. To play for the Olympic team, you have to go through a process of identifying, yes. of paperwork, of bureaucracy, of getting to Israel. And you become an Israeli. And you become an Israeli. Yes, that wasn't true for all the... Right. World Baseball no, no, Classic, no. Baseball Classic, no. You're absolutely correct. But in the, still, the criticism is that you're going to Tokyo with an American team okay. that happens to be Jewish, but they don't have on their uniform American Jew. What they have on their uniform is Israeli. Mm -hmm. And the critics say, it's not like we're not happy for you. Good, wonderful. But let's be honest. The honest statement is, this is not an Israeli team. Even though now Eric has made Aliyah, this is really a team of American ballplayers. And when you get on the field and play Spain, and I can't remember, I, I knew this when I walked in here, sure. I don't remember. The, the, in the last game, and we showed the last out, where, that was uh, South Africa. That, that was, was South, South right. Africa. So you beat South Africa. Right. Okay. And I'm thinking, of, and people would say, okay, you got American ball players playing South African ball players. Wouldn't you expect the Americans to win? As opposed to, you've got nine Israeli Sabras on the field. That would be more of a sort of a, a challenge for you as the manager. So I'm asking would the you two like of me you, or Peter to answer? Yeah. Yes. Because we, we can both give I want our to hear, perspectives I want here. to hear what you both say, and then you as a ball player, as an American Jewish kid who loved baseball and loved Israel, and now you made Aliyah because you wanted to play in the Classic. Peter's a lot better at being politically correct, okay. so I'll allow him <laughs> to oh, answer. No. I don't, I don't want politically No, then, then, then you'll, then you'll hear want, my answer well, afterwards. you'll hear his answer, too. Yeah. Nothing yep. he says will, will sway you. Not a thing. You'll tell no, me no, your no, answer. No. Oh, got, You okay. know that he says what he wants to All right. say. All right. <laughs> I have no, okay. no, no way to filter okay. this guy. You go, for, you go first. <laughs> first of all, it's true. 
the, there, there's four Israeli sabras on the team, okay, and there are 20 American Olim Chadashim on the team who immigrated Do they start? To Israel. They don't start. Okay, keep no. going. No, there were eight Israeli sabras who helped us in the first stage, and there were 20 sabras who helped us two years ago in the B pool in the European Championship. But obviously, when you bring better players, they come on account of the sabras, of, of the course. local sabras. And there is criticism in Israel about that yep. in my own organization. I'm fighting people in my own organization who say to me, they would like to have to see more and more Israeli sabras. Obviously, if we put Israeli sabras on the team, we wouldn't reach where we're reaching today. Right. So there's a, there's a trade-off here. There's a trade-off in where do you do the trade-off and course. what's important. Right. And I tell people that, you know, people, everybody, nobody knows who went to the Olympics and didn't get a medal. But they know who went to the Olympics and got a medal. So that's our, our goal is to get a medal, and I'll do whatever I need to do for the team to be able to get a medal. Although it's important to have the four Israeli sabers also for the Israeli press. Yes, and I applaud you. Keep going. Thank you. Um, You've got to now, now what's the, the substantive the, the, answer the, is? The, the Jewish Americans who were playing for us and who became Israeli, not only became Israeli in name and in, in passport, but they also became Israeli very much in the spirit. And I think you heard that from Eric before also. A lot of these guys played for us in the Classic. And they, they didn't know much about Israel, but when they were in the Classic, they heard more and more about it. They became Israeli citizens. They read a little bit more about it. They came to Israel. They visited us. They've already visited us twice in Israel. They've been twice to Israel. They've gone out. They've given clinics to the kids. They, see all the, all the, they, they know all the, loca the locations. They know what the Baptist Village field is. They know what the Sport Tech field is. They know everything about that. They know everything about Israel. They know the Dead Sea. They know the, the, the Jerusalem, the Kotel. They know Tel Aviv. There are more, much more Israelis than they ever have been before. We had one guy who stayed in Israel. He lived in Israel for six months. Um, I know there are other people who are talking about coming to Israel after their careers. Including me. So, including Eric, that's right. Including both Eric's here are looking to come to Israel to, to continue their careers as well. So there, there is much more identification on this team, on the Olympic team, than there was in the WBC team. There's no doubt about it. But don't forget... Others do the same. Uh, that was going to be my part. The Spanish team is all we'll let, well, let, we'll let, let me yeah, answer that part. And by the way, I know this to be true, right. and it's a very important point, sure. which most American Jews don't realize. Right. Speak Go to ahead. that. Okay. So, as we know, Israel's the size of New Jersey. Peter just finished telling you we have a thousand people playing baseball total, right? Children and adult in the entire country. Um, in our first round this year in Bulgaria, half the Bulgarian team was from Chicago and area. Half the Serbian team, one guy was in the Colorado Rockies organization, another one played at, uh, I want to say, Oklahoma. They were all Americans that got their dual citizenship in order to play. Greece was the same. Ireland was the same. Russia... Uh, actually had eight six, or six. six Cuban nationals who were given national status after the tournament um, uh, to be able to... So literally, we're playing against the team that's speaking Spanish but representing Russia. Our guys did nothing wrong. Yes, people threw out to us, oh, that's like a USA 2 team or... or I don't care what they say. The bottom line is, we're all Israeli. Uh, my, my players are Israeli. I have not made Aliyah yet. I will next year with my son when he makes it. Um, every one of my players is Israeli. We are American Jews that are proud to have made Aliyah and even more proud to be representing Israel in the Olympics. And I'm proud of you. I, am, I hope every Jew hears this. Every American who watches JBS hears this. And you're, you know, we're, we're talking about you. Okay. When you hear this discussion, what do you think? What comes to your mind? Yeah, I, I echo a lot of what they just said. But, I mean, for the overwhelming majority of the guys that are going to be on this team going forward, you know, we made Aliyah. No idea that we were actually going to be in the Olympics. We made Aliyah because it was something that we identified with and it was something that we felt was an important cultural value for us. And, you know, we made Aliyah because we wanted to represent Israel not because we wanted to be, you know, hey, we're going to go play baseball somewhere cool in Europe, but it was because we wanted to take the opportunity to be able to represent Israel and bring, hopefully, pride to Israel and doing something that, you know, we as a collective group are fairly good at doing and to, you know, be able to represent Israel with, you know, the type of success that we've had has been a blessing. 
we didn't know we were going into that with all the success that we were going to have. We knew we were going to go into it and be able to represent Israel. And so, you know, I think that is really, you know, that's my, that's my response is that we didn't go into it. We didn't become citizens to go to the Olympics. We became citizens to represent Israel. Oh, Eric, that is wonderful. I want to know what it's like, what, how you experienced the other players on the team. And then I want you to tell me, I'm sure that you're thrilled to be playing for Eric, but you played for other managers. And I want to know, what is it about Eric's style or Eric's philosophy or Eric's personality that makes him as successful as he, as he is? So first, I want to know, what, what's your relation to the other teammates, mm -hmm. to the extent to which you can tell me honestly, and to the extent to which you can honestly talk to me about Eric? Yeah, so in regards to teammates, you know, I came out of college baseball, and college baseball is something where everyone's really working for one collective goal. You know, winning is so important, and that's the unified team culture, and everyone's working towards that. I think, you know, once guys go from that to the minor leagues, it becomes a lot more working towards you know, you as a personal, you know, as a personal player. You're trying to have really good stats. You're trying to showcase yourself and get to the next level. And a lot of guys on our team have been through that system for a really long time. And so I would sort of say that, you know, when they came and when everyone came together to play on this team, Israel team, you know, no one's playing, hey, I want to hit three home runs and I want to be, you know, picked up by... You know, we're a bunch of guys that are, for more or less, we're, we're relatively washed up for, for, for the most part. Maybe a couple in players. In terms of a major league career. In terms of a potential major league career. You know, there's still some guys that have definite potential to go through the system, but guys are doing this because they want to win and they want to represent well. And so everyone's coming into that with that sort of mentality where, you know, hey, we're all going to be a team. We're all going to be in this together, you know. No one's going to be at each other's throat or anything. It's all... You enjoy each other? Yeah, absolutely. Everyone's working for the class. That's lovely. And, yeah. Uh, okay, now tell me about Eric, his manager. Oh, man, whole different story. No, <laughs> 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 nah, I know, absolutely not. Uh, so Eric, I mean, he just, he, he lets the guys play, which I think is, you know, something that's so massively important. He doesn't try to really overmanage or do anything or step on people's toes. He, you know, essentially, you know, what, what my college coach used to say is, you know, I'll roll the balls out there and you guys go play. You know, he, he knows what he has and he puts people in the right position to be successful and doesn't really overstep, which, you know, that's what a really, I think, successful it's manager lovely. does, especially when they have, you know, the types of players that we have on our team. So what's it been like for you? Forget the Jewish part, but to have, when I say the Jewish part, the, that you're in Israel, you have a team of you know, Jewish kids. What's that been like for you? Every two or three days, I, I pinch myself. Um, they've all just crawled under my skin in the last, uh, in a good way, you know, over the last year, year and a half. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of them weekly, you know, text messages, phone calls. Um, they're wonderful um, on the field, uh, but more so off the field. You know, Eric is the type of guy that, uh, you know, you want your daughter to marry. And this is, the, these are the guys that we have around us. They're mentors, they're, 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 they're great young men. Um, for me, um, Peter and I met with Nate Fish, I say this, we laugh about this all the time, at a, at a, a Midtown hotel over scrambled eggs um, in 2016. And on a scribbled up piece of yellow legal paper, Peter kind of gave me an idea of the players that I had to work with and his idea of what positions they would play and how this was going to work. And Peter and I had lunch today uh, before coming up to see you, and, and we were in agreement that um, at the beginning of last summer, like, success for us would have been getting to the A pool for the first time. Like, just get to the A pool, getting out of the B pool. The first time, real baseball for Israel. 
And, you know, to think that, you know, we're one of six teams, you know, going to the Olympics. And, and you know, it's like you said, just pinch me, pinch me. You know, I, I've, I've been blessed. Uh, Peter's done just an incredible job, uh, you know, really getting guys and recruiting guys and dealing with the logistics, um, uh, getting, you know, some tremendous coaches uh, for me. Um, you know, there's a couple that, that came with, uh, uh, with the team. Who, who have become, again, incredibly friendly uh, and, and good friends. Uh, my daughter uh, was our team nurse. My daughter's a, uh, a pediatric oncology uh, nurse at Sloan Kettering. She was our nurse uh, from Serbia in 2017, uh, Bulgaria, Lithuania, you know, through this, and she'll, she'll, she'll be at What's the Olympics. What's her name? Sydney. Sydney. Sydney Holt. Um, it's been unbelievable. It, it's just really, you know, like I said, you know, and then adding the coaches and, and the players, um, we talk about a lot, you know, these relationships that I'll have forever. And uh, uh, regardless of, of, of winning or losing, uh, we won. We, we, we've won already. Israel is going to have a ball sport, a team sport with 24 athletes in the Olympics for the first time in 44 years. We've won. Exactly. So, and we are so proud of you. Thank you. And anybody who knows about baseball knows, first of all, you have to have the talent. I don't care what, how good a manager is. Without the talent, it doesn't happen. But when you put some talent together with a good manager, you go to the Olympics. So mazal tov to you. Thank you, sir. I, I have modeled myself off of Joe Torre in the 96 World Series. You're a wise man. <laughs> <laughs> you get to wrap it up. What's it all mean to you? I'm, this is what a kick. On America, on, if people are watching on television all over the world, you and you playing in the Olympics for the state of Israel, that's something you've done. Mm -hmm. You, Peter. Kolak, a vote to you. So you get to, what's it, you know, what's it all mean as we're going to be watching right. Team Israel in Tokyo in the 2020 Summer Olympics? First of all, if you watch to, uh, Team Israel in Tokyo 2020 in the Summer Olympics, I hope that we're, we're going to get a medal because that's one of our goals, to get a medal. There's I no do doubt too. about it. That's one of our goals. Um, but even more so, I mean, our participation in the Olympics is important. It's huge, um, and it's big. But even bigger is, is developing baseball in Israel. And this is just one stepping stone in that direction. And, you know, to go to the Olympics is fun and everything. It's great. But it's got to lead to something else. It's got to lead to developing baseball in Israel. And I hope at this time next year, we don't have a, we, we're not talking about 1,000 kids. We're talking about 2,000 and 2,500 kids. And that's the direction we want to go into because building fields is important. Getting PR is important, and getting, getting a medal is important, because getting a medal, nobody remembers who was in the Olympics and didn't get a medal. But they all remember Israel has nine Olympic medals. And, they, and I think every Israeli child can tell you who those nine Olympic medals are. And I'm hoping that now we can bring 24 Olympic medals. When I, when I got back in September from the qualifiers, um, and I went to the first time to see the Olympic Committee, uh, at that time there were about 45 athletes going to the Olympics, and I added another 24. So they were surprised. They were happy. They knew about it because I told them a year before. As a matter of fact, a year before, they had to fill out a page for the uh, Japanese Olympic Committee that said which sports Israel would qualify for. And they filled all, all the sports, and they also put in baseball. And the Japanese Olympic Committee sent it back to them and said there's no way Israel's going to come in baseball. <laughs> so being there is fun. And as I mentioned to you before, the U18 team that's going to the, Olympic, the, the European Championship this coming summer before the Olympics is going to be huge for us and very important as well because that's the future of Israeli baseball. But even more so, if this Olympics can be a stepping stone, if we can all get medals and then come back to Israel and see 2,500 kids in Israel, then I know I've accomplished my, my mission. You were Thank fabulous. You. Thank you. You have to promise me you'll keep coming back as the story unfolds. Of course. Kol Tu Hatzlacha in all you're doing. And you, you guys, you're fabulous. Uh, and I am so glad that I now know you, Eric. And Eric, you were just wonderful. By the way, the comment you made as an aside, you wouldn't mind if people sent emails they'd like to meet you? <laughs> they should send them to me. Yeah, yeah, let me, right, let yeah. me screen it for him first. Can I give you my mom's email? <laughs> <laughs> You're wonderful. You're wonderful. I hope not only Peter comes back, that you'll come back sure, also. Sure. And I don't want to embarrass you, but you do understand in a, in a in a corner of Jewish history, right. your name will be written for what you've done. <laughs> in a you. corner of Jewish history, you as the manager, your name will be written. And you, as one of the players on this team that is going to the Olympics, your name will be there. You are all doing something bigger than yourselves. And you make us all proud. 
and you make me proud that you came to be with us here on JBS. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> there you have it. Peter Kurz, general manager. Eric Holds, the manager. And one of our top pitchers. I hope he pitches a lot in Tokyo. Eric Brodkowitz. And I know you all join me in wishing every one of them and every one on the entire team a most successful series in the Tokyo Olympics. And I hope Peter is back here carrying a medal to show us all. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you have to any of the ideas expressed here on this edition of L'Chai. And please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. And remember, you can now take L'Chaim with you wherever you go. We are a podcast. You want to listen to this program again in your car while you're exercising? Just download the L'Chaim podcast. There's in the news also of JBS. And listen to any L'Chaim you wish. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. And we're especially pleased to remind you that thanks to a generous matching gift from the Cayley family, every new or increased dollar you donate to JBS will be worth double to JBS. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.